Good morning and welcome to the 21st annual exhibit of hydrogen and fuel cell technologies. Uh, we've always been uh, wondering when we're going to have the infrastructure to market certain products. The mobile applications are there, um, they're clean technologies, and uh, it all depends on how fast we can get the grid up to supply the vehicles that are on the move. Uh, this is one of the focuses of H2 Logic, it's an international company, um, and we'll be talking to Jakob uh, uh, Kogsgaard, who's CEO at H2 Logic, about hydrogen station technologies. Please welcome with me um, Jakob Knosgaard. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So I will be presenting our, our new hydrogen station product uh, in our H2 station family. Uh, so thank you for, for listening in, uh, also online. Uh, so this is a picture of how the station could look like. Uh, before going into detail about the, uh, the new generation station, uh, I would just like to tell a little bit about the, the legacy that you're actually bringing with us. Uh, this is the first 700 bar station that we uh, made in 2011 in Denmark, and, uh, and now we actually know it was the first one to comply with the SAE J2601, which is the standard defining how to fuel between a, a, a 700 bar car and the station, and to make that with infrared communication, etc. Uh, by lucky coincidence, this is my home city, so I'm actually using this one on a weekly basis because I have an FCV there. Um, we also showed a video about installing our H2 station car 100 in 48 hours. I think uh, a lot of you have probably seen that one, that video uh, on YouTube, um, and that's basically the legacy that we are that we are bringing with us. We also bring the legacy of uh, having installed basically already a country-wide network of hydrogen stations in Denmark. So this is uh, Denmark, uh, two hours north of here, you hit the border, and then, uh, and then you have the little country of Denmark. 5.5 million people, and we are now installing the hydrogen station number 10. So uh, that actually makes Denmark uh, the world and the country with most hydrogen stations per inhabitant. And it's actually possible for us to have 50% uh, of the Danish population have less than 15 kilometers to a hydrogen refueling station. So we have done this in, uh, in two joint venture corporations, one with uh, OK, a Danish retailer of oil, and, and Strandmullen, and the second with five stations in a joint venture with Alikit. You can also see on, uh, on this chart that this is the hydrogen sold in 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, and this has already increased significantly. Um, this is good. Uh, at the end of 2015, we had uh, 56 fuel cell cars installed in, uh, in operation in Denmark, which is not much, but they're actually being used. A lot of the fuel cell cars registered around, they are not being used. Secondly, in Denmark, all of these uh, stations, they operate with electrolyzers. So uh, six of them have on-site electrolyzer, so we have directly coupled on site with the power and water in, produce hydrogen, pressurized to the 900 bar, and then fill the cars. The other uh, four to five stations, they get hydrogen uh, produced from a centralized electrolyzer here, uh, an L electrolyzer that is also part of our group, and then distributed to these, uh, to these stations. So we are showing here the two different concepts of having electrolyzer and having completely renewable hydrogen production. In Denmark, 42% of all of our electricity comes from, uh, ca or came from wind power in 2015. That's a lot. It's very difficult to handle. And it's a part of the Danish strategy, the national Danish strategy, to use that surplus electricity when the wind is blowing and convert that to a clean fuel. So we're doing that, showing that already. Well, this is, this is the legacy and this is, what, this is why, what we have brought into the development of our, of our next generation station. And that is uh, the H2 station car 200. 200 is uh, the name of the rated daily capacity, 200 kilograms a day. We can actually sell much more of it if we want. So we managed to make the station with one third of the footprint of what we had at the previous version. We managed to, to triple the capacity. So that was actually quite some uh, achievements our engineers did. Um, so what you have here is the, the hydrogen equipment enclosure where you have the compressor, you have the cooling system, you have all of the controls here, and then you have the high-pressure fueling storage next to it. Um, 
Then you can have a dispenser. Of course, of course, you need to connect the dispenser to your uh, to your hydrogen station to fuel cars. What we really made of, uh, of of new great innovations are a dispenser that can be placed up to 50 meters away from the station, and still we have no heat exchanger installed at the dispenser or underneath the dispenser. So that makes the installation extremely simple, and that makes it possible to make the installation on on brownfields. Brownfields being uh, traditional gasoline uh, gasoline sites. The dispenser is uh, is actually so compact; it's 54 times 54 centimeters, that you can actually uh, install two of them side by side. One fueling on one side, one fueling on the other side, and the footprint is equal to an e existing uh, Tokheim or Warren Dresser uh, gasoline dispenser. Uh, so it's already prepared for that. You can also uh, install it at the end of a dispenser island, like you can see here, uh, just schematically. You can install it at the end here, and then you can fuel on both this side and this side with just one dispenser. Uh, and because of it being so compact, uh, you can use the existing dispenser island. We also worked on the, uh, on the user interface, because what we have seen on the network in, uh, in Denmark are that uh, the reasons for some customers not getting a full fill is not because the station is failing. It's because they are doing the six different points in a wrong, uh, in a wrong order, or they're not pressing the right buttons. So the user interface is extremely important. Uh, I just made the test with my own wife, with my FCV. She's scared when she's fueling it. So it has to be simple, it has to be very intuitive and easy to communicate. Uh, so that we, that we also included. The, uh, the principle of the station looks like this. Meaning that we can basically use any kind of hydrogen supply to the station. So uh, this is the station. You can either have it from dump off or pipeline, on-site production from reforming or electrolysis as we prefer it. Uh, then you can also have a supply storage if you have a trailer that dumps off into that. The, uh, the station compresses into fueling storage, cooling control, and then to the dispenser. And that gives us these different hourly capacities depending on, uh, depending on the country and depending on the refueling profile that the customers are expecting. If we go st uh, starting with low capacity, we can even take a pipeline and go directly into the station, then afterwards upgrade with a, with a feeding compressor uh, if your utilization goes up. So everything we, pr we tried to do with the CAR 200 is really to make a standard hydrogen station. And the reason for that is point one, because we want to pr produce it on a running production line, because that is what will really cut down the cost. But secondly, it's also because we need to comply with the functional safety principles of the oil, energy, and gas companies. So this is a, a chart. I'll not go too much into detail with it, but this is the risk evaluation matrix for hydrogen stations. It's exactly the same that oil and gas companies are using on, using on their uh, oil platforms or on their traditional installations of, uh, of oil and gas. So this is basically showing the, uh, uh, the consequences of, uh, of different uh, worst-case scenarios, how frequent they can happen, and when we can accept them to happen or not. When we then do the HACCP analysis, if we conclude that the risk is too high, so we are in these levels, then we will have to make uh, a quantitative risk assessment, making sure that we can get, get down the, uh, the risk level to an acceptable level. We also uh, included a, um, a, a complete redundant control system. So it's two, com uh, it's two separate PLCs, one handling the control of the station, another one handling the safety of the station. Uh, and by doing that, we can, uh, we can make the sufficient, high, uh, uh, the sufficient high functional safety. Some customers are saying, well, we would like a, a station, but just please change that and that. If you do that, then these more than 2,000 hours we used on the, on the safety principles, you have to throw that away, and then you can only use so much hours on one specific station because it's a project. Therefore, if you buy standard, you get it, it gets cheaper. So we also made the CAR 200 so that it can be installed or transported around the world. We produce it in our factory in Denmark. Then this is our way of, con uh, of containerizing. The station is not a container, the station goes inside a standard shipping container and we can ship it all around the world to our customers. 
We have also seen some customers looking for an enclosure solution, so a design of, your, of the station, so it can be installed greenfield and make it look nice. So that is what we also did. This is the, this is the CAR 200 station and the dispenser, fueling storage and supply storage behind this enclosure. And this enclosure is also the, the fire protection, so you can basically have cars or children or kindergarten right on the outside of it, and there's still no, uh, there's still no risk attached to it. Then I would be showing a video about the enclosure, which I cannot, that's okay. So you can all see that on our booth, it's a B60 just down the hall here. Um, there we have a video about the enclosure so that you have a chance to see it. The enclosure is, of course, just an example. It can be, uh, it can be made in any, in any brand the customer has. We're just showing it in white because that's neutral. It can be red, yellow. It can be graphic with any kind of uh, graphic the oil, gas, energy company or a greenfield would like to do. So this is uh, basically bricks of Lego that we, uh, that we are working with. We come from Denmark, so that is where the Lego bricks were invented. So these are the bricks that we are working with. It's the H2 stays and fueling storage, uh, supply storage, electrolyzers, and these can basically be put together in all of these different configurations. And if you prepare your site for it, they can also be upgraded on site so that you actually end up with a station that has up to, up to 800 kilogram a day capacity. You can also afterwards upgrade it with on-site electrolysis if needed. So this is the, the principle that we try to include. If you consider it on brownfields, brownfield either being uh, the forecourt of a shopping center or a supermarket or directly at, uh, at gasoline sites, well, you can use the same principles. Typically, oil gas companies, they would use their own branding, which is absolutely fine. You can take the modules and place them however you want to place them, or you can take this enclosure and place next to it. Then you have something that is still extremely compact. What, uh, what we're also doing, uh, and right now we're doing that in Norway with, uh, with great success, is to make large-scale centralized electrolyzers and distributing hydrogen from there on. We're making a site with uh, on-site electrolyzers, and we're making various sites where we will have hydrogen from centralized electrolyzers that will then be distributed out to the stations. We're also doing it in Denmark, and we're planning to do it elsewhere, because that is really where we can see we can make a benefit. A complete hydrogen supply chain from the renewable through the electrolyzers distribution and the hydrogen stations. That turnkey, that is something that we would like to, to supply to our customers, and we can do that within our group. When we go big, we need a big factory. And that's what we're preparing for. So uh, this is actually the new factory that we just announced uh, a few weeks ago that we are buying and rebuilding to production of hydrogen stations. In the beginning, we will not be able to produce the 300 stations that we announced, but we have the capacity for it when the, sta when the, the factory is fully utilized. If you, if you make some comparison, that station can actually manufacture, uh, that factory can manufacture enough hydrogen stations uh, that equals 200,000 fuel cell cars. That's our yearly capacity. So now it's not about if the infrastructure can be made from us, it's actually about if we can have the automotive OEMs to provide cars at the same time as the infrastructure, so the chicken and the egg go hand in hand together. Um, so that's, uh, that's really my, uh, my last comment. And then I'm a, a personal driver of an FCV, uh, I was the lucky one to have the one of the very first Mirai here in Europe. Uh, I've been driving 22,000 kilometers in it since October, and I must just say I, I love it. It's uh, completely 100% on renewable hydrogen, and I actually drove it here to Hanover. So, I think that's me. It is, because there's nothing else. <laughs> it, it must be over. Wonderful presentation. I'm sure there's some questions from the audience. Uh, I made it perfect then. Uh, you, exactly, you explained <laughs> everything. I think uh, there's a few points that deserve to be stressed um, when we get into the issue of safety. Uh, there are statistics um, in Germany and other countries, living next door to a gas station is not exactly healthy. Um, uh, if it's a diesel gas station, you have the fine particle pollution. Um, uh, so um, there's another safety factor in there. Um, yeah. These, of course, the fumes from hydrogen, 
and there probably aren't any, but if there were... They would just, they would just go in the air. Okay. So, uh, with, so with respect to the, the local environment, there's absolutely no, uh, no, uh, no issues with respect to health coming from a hydrogen station. Mm -hmm. um, there can be issues related to, to safety if you don't handle it uh, properly. Mm -hmm. So that is what we are extremely careful about, and we should all be in the industry to be careful about, uh, about safety and implementing the, the highest level of safety. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we still need also to make our products more and more and more commercial. Mm -hmm. So not forgetting safety in that process of uh, chasing profit. Mm -hmm. I always get nervous because I'm so dedicated to this industry. When people say safety and hydrogen, um, many respond with, it is scary, isn't it? But we used to have demonstrations of hydrogen tanks at 700 bars and people would shoot guns at them and wait for the explosions. In fact, cars explode more readily than hydrogen fuel cell cars, don't they? Yeah, well, when you, uh, when you ask the automotive OEMs, they say that a fuel cell car and a gasoline car, they are equally safe. Mm -hmm. And actually, if the, if the gasoline car was invented today, no one would actually allow it to be on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, simply because it's, uh, the way we are fueling it is extremely unsafe, but now it's standard anywhere in the world. It's culture. It's like putting up with smoking, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, one final question. Um, you mentioned um, uh, how you use uh, local sources of energy. You produce the hydrogen on site. Now, for me, um, setting up a network uh, with gasoline involves trucking the stuff in. I you rarely have um, someone put a hole in the ground and look for oil there and set up a refinery. Um, I'm wondering if these remote locations in future or right now actually could operate independent of personnel. That is, you set up the thing, um, you have wind power, and um, you have an intelligent uh, grid tell it when to produce hydrogen and, and so on, that it would operate entirely remotely. Is that, that is, feasible? That is a perfect idea and it's already happening. Wonderful. <laughs> Okay. So that, uh, the stations that we have in Denmark, um, the six of them with on-site electrolyzers, they are unmanned. All of the stations that we are providing are unmanned, otherwise it will kill your business case. Mm -hmm. So they are unmanned with on-site electrolyzers, and the wind turbines are also, uh, of course, unmanned. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that is currently manned in Denmark is basically just the monitoring of it. But that is done centrally. From uh, We have, we have a 24-7 monitoring central that we provide a service for all of our customers. The same goes with the ones operating the wind turbines. Mm -hmm. This is a revolution because it makes remote um, uh, automotive um, uh, uh, transport uh, feasible in areas where uh, gasoline and diesel would be even more problematic. I find this fascinating. It's okay. been a pleasure talking to you. Um, Thank you. Uh, Jakob uh, Koksad, who's CEO at H2Logic, will be continuing briefly with uh, a colleague of yours. Yes, um, And with H2Logic, so stay seated. We'll be back in a moment. Thank you. Oh, one question? Are there, are there any loses of hydrogen from a storage? C come again. Are there any losses of hydrogen from the storage during the day? A uh, losage. Lo losses. 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 No, no, there's no, there's no losses. We, uh, currently, we only have gaseous hydrogen, meaning that we either we produce it gaseous from electrolyzers or we get it delivered by hydrogen trailers. And then there's no boil off. So all hydrogen is within the, is within the cylinders. If you go with, uh, with liquid hydrogen, that can be boil off if it's not used. Uh, so there are, that's, there are some different uh, pros and cons for that. What our stations know. Good. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We'll be back in one minute.